Amen. Thank you, Lord. Have your way here this evening. God, we pray that you would set people free from the bondage of offense, from the the seed of offense. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, minister, minister here this evening, minister, Lord, to everyone that would listen, everyone that's tuned in now and those who would watch by way of archive. We pray right now in the name of Jesus. We acknowledge our need for you, God. We can do nothing without you. We depend on you uh, for all things, Lord. We need your uh, guidance and we need your spirit. We need your anointing. We need your understanding, your revelation. Have your way here tonight, God. Pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that you would capture the attention of everyone that would uh, spend time uh, to listen. I pray, Lord, that uh, people would give their attention to it. I bind every distraction. I speak against every spirit that would cause distraction. That your people, Lord, would uh, take heed. They would be attentive uh, to what you would desire to communicate this evening. I pray that people would not take this as a another evening of just communication. But I pray right now, God, that people will move past and look past the vessel and look towards your word. Let them sense your spirit, oh God. I pray that this would be a timely word, fitly spoken. In the name of Jesus Christ, we need your spirit, oh God, to move past our flesh, to move past our natural mind. The natural man can't receive the things of the spirit because you said in your word that they are foolishness to him. So I'm asking you, Lord, to move upon the spirit of man. Move, oh God, the, the flesh of man out of the way that it would not be a hindrance to what you desire to say. I believe tonight is a night for deliverance for those who would receive it, oh God, because this is your word. It's the ministry of your spirit, God. You came, as you said, to set the captives free. You came to proclaim liberty to, to those that are bound, oh God. You came to heal and to deal with the brokenhearted, those who are bruised and wounded, O oh Lord. A smoke and flax you won't quench, O oh God. And a bruised reed you will not crush and destroy. We pray right now in the name of Jesus, we pray for the healing balm of Gilead to flow and to move as the Spirit can do and only the Spirit can do, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for the ministry of angels. God, as you have ministered and have sent your angels to minister to those who will become the heirs of salvation and loose the ministry of angels, oh God, you have provided comfort and you provided strength through, through this ministry. We pray right now, Father, we pray for the ministry of the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. We pray for peace that peace would be multiplied. We pray right now that people would respond and that they would have great peace. You said it in your word, great peace have they that love your law and nothing by any means should offend them. We pray right now in the name of Jesus and I bind in the name of Jesus Christ every demonic force that would work against your people that would cause them to be despondent to your word, that would cause them to be distracted from your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, 
I speak by the authority of the Holy Ghost and in the name of Jesus Christ. Do not let them uh, be distracted. Do not let them go into a place of complacency. In the name of Jesus, stir up the spirit, stir up the mind, stir up the heart, stir up them in their lives. Lord, you desire change in us, change of mind, change of direction, clean heart, right spirit, O oh God. We pray that ministry in your body. It is your will to heal your body. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak it even now, Father. In Jesus' name, praise God. Praise God. We want to uh, welcome you for uh, tuning in. We want to welcome everyone who's uh, tuning in here for this uh, session. Amen. I've communicated and I've given you a, a hint and a clue or maybe just a direct uh, word as to what we'll, we will be communicating tonight. Uh, I uh, spoke to someone. I, I received a text several weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, from someone. Um, no one knows this. The person who uh, sent the text, don't worry. No one knows who you are. I need to use this as a reference point. Please understand my intent uh, for this. And I did communicate to that person. When I speak this lesson, please understand. I told him, before you say anything, I'm letting you know I'm going to be talking about this in a couple of weeks. And when I communicate this message, you need to know that I'm going to be communicating this and uh, because the adversary is going to have you to think that I'm speaking this message for them. And I, for you, I told them, and I said, so I'm not. Uh, I feel like the Holy Ghost is wanting me to address this. And, uh, and so, uh, and I know without a doubt uh, that... Um, this is the direction. Um, so, anyway, again, uh, if you're out there and you're watching this, I believe the Holy Ghost is going to hit some key areas in the lives of people who are listening, uh, both now and those who will listen uh, going forward. I'm telling you, in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost told me this, that that's what would happen. And some of you who I pastor, you're going to think, out of certain things that I say that you're going you're gonna to feel like he's talking to me. I, I, I trust me when I say I don't have a single target, but the Holy Ghost has a single target, and that's his church, people of God. Um, and everything I have here, this, when I uh, spoke to that person over the phone, I had this stuff already ready, and packaged, and uh, and so um, I didn't really spend a whole lot of time since then with these notes. Maybe two times, at the most three, and not a lot of time with with that. And so I didn't do tweaking based on anything. I uh, I just felt that the Holy Ghost was going to want to address this, and lo and behold, here we are. And so. And I believe this is critical for where we are as a church and a church body, not just for where we are right now currently, but where we are going. I believe if we do not get this uh, message, and I'm not saying, oh, people who don't hear this, that there, there's no hope for them. I'm, I'm saying that whatever way God desires to get the attention of his people throughout, um, this world. I do believe that uh, this is going to be a necessary component uh, moving forward in, uh, in, in whatever way, whichever way God desires to communicate to his people worldwide. That's his, his business. But uh, I'm telling you because the scripture says, uh, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And uh, when things get really rough, things get really bad, you would suspect 
that people would run and flock uh, to the things of God or that it would be an awakening call and they would put things in its proper place and get things in order. But sometimes it's to the contrary. As a matter of fact, when we read the book of Revelation, it marvels me to see the scripture uh, that uh, describes the condition of man um, when the tribulation period begins. And during the tribulation period, you, while there will be people that will be saved in the tribulation period, not based on the salvation that we have, not the New Testament plan of salvation. I know some people believe that no one will have a chance to be saved. I don't believe Christians today will have that opportunity. I believe that there are people, though, that will be born and living and existing that, that never responded to God and that will have an opportunity, uh, but the way of life will be death. Scripture says that people will be headed uh, to accept what uh, the, the uh, faith and the plan of salvation for that time. I believe that the uh, people will go back to a uh, plan of salvation uh, that, that was in existence uh, before the birthday of the church, before uh, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1 and uh, ch chapter 2. And so these people... You look at these people and you see some things. These people, a lot of people, the Bible said they did not repent. They were angry at, at God. They started shaking their fists at God and they started uh, blaspheming and things of that nature. And the Bible says they continued in their sin and their sorceries and all those things. Uh, and, and they were angry at God. And so during the worst period for man in, in the entire existence of man, you will have people on earth that will get angry at God, or I'll give it a better word, offended with God. And so, and that's why I believe it's critical because when things get worse, either people, you will have two, peop, two types of people, people who will respond and know they need to get things right, and on the other side, people who will get angry protests, just go crazy. And so what I'm saying is that judgment begins at the household of God. Uh, God will always expect his people to exhibit what he's communicating because we are his children. It should be expected of us to conduct ourselves in the manner that God desires us to because we have the Holy Ghost, we have the blood, we have the name, we have uh, uh, the, the information and the word of God in us, and so we are without a, an excuse. Now, people who don't know God, hadn't experienced God, they don't necessarily, they, I think they would have an excuse. So God judges us first, because how can he judge someone who doesn't know? Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He, he, he was praying for God's mercy upon these people that were crucifying him because they were ignorant of what was transpiring. But we, as the people of God, we're not ignorant of some things. And so uh, people were offended with God in the, when you read the book of Revelation. And so I want to talk to you uh, tonight about uh, this, to me, a very important topic uh, and, and a very important uh, session. And um, I think it's critical. It's uh, overcoming offenses. Overcoming offenses. Now, from the onset, uh, some people probably will... Tune me out. Well, I'm not offended. Uh, when I get to near the end of this, you're going to uh, be brought to something that's going to come to mind, uh, and that is offense or being offended is one of the most deceptive things. It's almost like uh, being deceived. When you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. Sometimes when someone lies to you, you know when they lie. But when you deceive, you don't know you deceive. And the problem with being offended is that 
Many people walk around with this disease and don't know that they have it because it's the adversary. There's a, a, a book that's called The Bait of Satan, and some people who are listening will know, notice and recall that title, uh, The Bait of Satan, and uh, offense is, is the bait of Satan. I'm, I'm going to uh, talk to you about this, and again, don't tune me out because you don't feel like you need it, or, well, that's one of those things I just handle when I, when I need to. This thing is so subtle. It's so deceptive. It, it, it's a trap that the adversary uses most for the people of God. I'm going to say that again, and it's not a uh, hyperextended, hyperbole type of statement. It's probably the the main thing that the adversary uses in the war against the people of God. And I assure you that the adversary has used this uh, to attack you. And it's very important to understand when you are a victim not of circumstances, not a victim of someone treating you wrong or speaking to you wrong or doing something to you that you feel like they have uh, wronged you, but you are a victim of Satan and you are a victim to offense. Most of the time we think that uh, we, the, the grudge that we hold towards a person it's because of the hideous nature uh, of the, um, the, the thing that was done. And that's the, the, the great deception of offense, is that uh, this spirit and the action of defense makes you feel justified, and, uh, and it allows you to stay under its control uh, because of the, the feeling of justification. And, and you don't know that you are offended. The problem with this is that at that time, you don't realize you're not saved. I made that strong statement from the onset. I'm telling you right now in the Holy Ghost, if the rapture, if that trumpet sounds, and you're walking around with an offense towards God or man when the trumpet blows, you haven't forgiven, and you're not going, period. As the bishop would say, point blank, period. And I don't think any, any person or anything that's done to anyone is worth losing your salvation. Paul, Paul said, hey, man, I, after I've done all this, preached all this, I don't want to be a castaway. He said, you know what I do? I put my body under subjection. I, I buffeted it. I beat it. There are things that Paul said he had to do because he realized as great as a preacher he was, as a great of an apostle he was, he could lose out on his place and his salvation if he didn't take care of certain things. And if Paul and his uh, splendor of excellency as a man of God could lose out on his salvation, surely we can. Jesus picked Judas, not to be a, 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 uh, a, um, a one who's possessed by the devil and controlled by the devil. He chose him to be a disciple. He chose him to be a, uh, an apostle. Yes, he faulted, he failed, and Jesus knew that, but Jesus didn't call him to fail. You can be called of God and lose out. Moses lost out on entering into the promise based on one smite of a rock. Don't think offense is just something, uh, some little toy that you can play with anytime you like and put it down anytime you desire. It's like a match. And one little match can cause a, a, a fire that burns all the the forest in California, it's a dangerous thing. And don't think for one minute you have control over offense. I'm telling you right now, offense has control over people. 
and I, I, I'm starting this off without teaching, but trying to get the, the severity of it because what we don't understand with offense is that it is the spirit that works unforgiveness. And Jesus said, the Father, your heavenly Father cannot cannot forgive you if you haven't forgiven your brothers of his trespasses. And when you have and I have an offense towards someone, you are not forgiven at that moment. Hear me in the Holy Ghost. Is anything worth you not being forgiven by God? Jesus said in this prayer when he taught us how to pray, uh, forgive uh, as you are forgiven. And he said, if you can't forgive men of your trusp of their trespasses, your heavenly father can't forgive you of yours. So everything that God has forgiven you for, imagine that. Imagine you living for God for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and you're harboring offense towards someone, and everything you've done, there's no blood covering it. And the deception is I'm walking around and I'm fine with God. I'm praying to God. I'm going to church. I'm praying my, paying my tithes. I'm doing everything I know to do. Maybe I'm a preacher. Amen. Maybe I'm a pastor. Maybe I'm a leader. Maybe I'm an evangelist. Maybe I'm an apostle or prophet. But you have an offense in your heart. You think you're going to get to heaven based on your work? No. An offense is a very thing, dangerous thing. And I'm, again, I'm addressing everybody in the church, everyone that's listening to me. Is it worth it? So we're going to talk about overcoming offenses. Overcoming offenses. I'm telling you right now, this is the main uh, device of the enemy because if he can get you, he doesn't care if you can live for God, pray people through, baptize people, amen, prophesy, do many wonderful works in his name, hey, you can cast out a couple of his his, 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 uh, his peons, you can, you can cast out some of his imps, and he doesn't care about that because if you, if he can get you to be offended with God or man, he's one. He can throw one stone, one little pebble in your pond, your pond of peace, and cause a, a tsunami of catastrophe by one small pebble in your pond. If you can turn with me to Acts chapter 24 and verse number 16, again, uh, this message is, is, I believe, urgent and critical. The moment, the moment God gave me this message, and the moment I received that text from someone that said, Pastor, I am offended. And the Holy Ghost spoke. And I waited, a, I waited, I think, a day, a day and a half, two days before I responded. Maybe it was hours, but I did not respond to the text message because I knew the Holy Ghost was addressing the church, and God wanted to address the church, and God wanted to communicate to the church and, and to this particular person uh, uh, a concern of some things, because I'm telling you, we, when we are offended, we believe someone has done us wrong, and we feel like we're okay. And we don't understand when we carry that, that we're not the victim. We're the perpetrator. We're not the victim. We are the, uh, the criminal, for lack of better terms. When we are offended, we feel like someone has wronged us, and we are the victim. Trust me, we need to get rid of, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Do we need to get rid of that victim mentality? Because that's the deception. I feel like I'm a victim. Do you understand that there are certain people who are 
Victims who have become a victim of someone who's holding them hostage will wind up having the um, Stockholm Syndrome where they're no longer the victim. They're actually participating in the crime of the one who holds them hostage. Now they are fighting along with the one who captured them. Do you understand when we get offended that now we go from being the victim that moment the thing happened or the supposed thing happened that now we are participating in the crime and now we are against the authorities and we have this Stockholm Syndrome and we don't see it. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost you may just think I'm just talking I pray in the name of Jesus in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I am so concerned there has been several people over. I talked to someone else who was uh, highly offended, and I talked to them on, 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 uh, about that and about dealing with their, their, their heart issue and everything else, and I talked to them about being offended with God, and, and this is several people I've actually talked to over the last little while or whatever, but I, I talked to them about this, uh, the, 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 the importance of, because they were offended with God. They couldn't see that they were offended with God, and I began to talk to them about their actions and, and their ways and to get them to see because they couldn't see that their action, again, I, I spoke before, I don't know your heart, and I hadn't gotten into my, 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 uh, my lesson yet. Uh, I'm just trying to flow in the Holy Ghost. I, I, uh, the thing I, I spoke of is that I, I don't know a person's heart, but I can sense a person's, you can, you can, uh, a person's spirit. Amen. And the thing about spirit, spirit can, can change. It's like a, a chameleon. Amen. You can be fine around one person and not fine around another, and, and you can be up and down or whatever the case may be because that's, you know. But I, you can tell when somebody's spirit is off or at least, you know, whatever. And, and, and the thing is, uh, but, and that's one way you can tell as far as your heart. But, and, again, I can't read a person's heart. But the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So another indication when a person's heart is not right is their communication how they talk, how they communicate. Uh, another way is their actions. Uh, the Bible says um, uh, out of the, the, the heart, out of the heart is, are the issues of life. And so the heart, you will be able to see things just because the heart speaks. Your actions, your words, and your spirit reveals where your heart is. And so while a person cannot read your heart, they would be um, what you would call uh, guessing, assuming, and anything else when they try to tell you what's on your heart because they can't see your heart. But you don't have to have guesswork to see what's in somebody's heart based on what's coming out of them, what's coming out of their actions, what's coming out of their mouth, and what's coming out of their spirit. You can tell what someone's heart is. So anyway... Here we are, Acts chapter 24, verse 16. Y'all okay? Y'all on board? Y'all with me? You turn me off, you shut me down, you ignore me. You say, there's that pastor. Uh, you know, amen, I'm, he's not my pastor. Maybe someone who I'm not the pastor, I don't know. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself. Paul said, I exercise myself. Herein do I exercise. Now, exercise, I, I want to, to, to talk about that for a second. Exercise is strenuous. You know, don't tell me you're exercising if you, <laughs> you, you, you do a, a push-up and a half and you say, Shh, I'm done. Don't tell me you're exercising if you run for a minute and then you quit. No, you're not exercising. You, you may have, uh, have attempted to exercise. Paul said, herein do I exercise myself. In other words, he said, I work out with this. 
I make it my priority. One thing I do know about exercising, you have to maintain it. You have to do it on a regular basis. Um, I, I, I have a, a brother-in-law, he runs. He, he runs every single morning. He get out there and he runs and he runs and he says, hey, uh, when I don't run, I feel it the next day when I get back out there and run. Well, I've been, for the last couple of months, I've been building up a, a, uh, a, a exercise routine, at least a running routine. And, and um, I'm up to running right now. And each morning, I, I do a 5K run. And so I, uh, I'm up to 5K. One, maybe I'll do a marathon one day, but I, I do 5K. Uh, and that's what I'm, I'm doing every, every single morning. Uh, I do 5K. And, I, and uh, if I don't do it, and I also try to do a, a mile, mile and a half every evening. And in addition to walking in the afternoon. And so, but I'm building up. It didn't, it, it didn't, the first day, the first couple of times I tried it, I was, I was running for about five minutes and oh my goodness, I was exhausted. I was wore myself up. I moved it up to 10 and then I moved it up to 15 minutes. Then I moved it up to 20, then moved it up to 25, moved it up to 30. And then I start doing the, the 5K. And, 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 and so I, I, I was exercised. I, I, I worked myself up to it. I, I built up myself to it. And now it's, it's easier to do that. And Paul was saying that he had to exercise himself. He had to build himself up. It was not just something he could just turn on and do and all of a sudden he had it down packed. Don't tell me that it's so easy for you to just switch and just deal with offense just like that and you're okay and offense is no issue from I'm telling you, you have to spend time learning how to exercise yourself to get to a place where you are not easily offended with people and with God. He exercised himself. He worked out to have always a conscious, his, con his subconscious being void of offense towards God first. Notice that that's going to be important in this lesson. And I, don't, I think it's going to wind up being a two or three part lesson more than likely because I hadn't even begun the notes yet. I'm on the first scripture. And, and notice this. Notice. He, he said to always, not sometimes, not most of the time, not once in a while, or he said to always, I wish I had the whole congregation here right now, wherever you are, say always, please say that wherever you are. If someone is with you, get them to say always. Tell your neighbor always, amen. Somebody tell your neighbors always. Paul said this, he, did, he could have left this out and just said, hey, this is what I, I exercise myself to have a conscious. He didn't say I exercise myself to have a, 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 a conscious void of offense. And sometimes we quote that particular scripture like that here into our exercise to have a, a conscious void of offense and I sometimes quote that but I leave out the word always I believe the word always is critical because what if you don't have always and one moment in time you allow offense to win the war and then you get entrapped with it and something gets in your spirit and gets in your heart and it's like a cancer or a bug or a virus that you don't don't know it's there and this cancer is spreading and spreading it's metastasizing all over your body and then one day you realize next thing you know it's too late it's terminal there's no hope I believe this is a very important and critical lesson Paul said I exercise I work out at this to have always Always a conscious, conscious, void, absent, absent of offense, absent of offense towards God, towards man. So the several people Recently, not including over the years that I've been pastoring, where you said, I'm offended, Pastor. People that I know that have, uh, who have been offended with me as a pastor. Uh, I, I'm going I'm to say, say it like this, and I'm going to get back to what I, I was just communicating. Uh, Bishop Wright has have, 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 have said, you know Bishop Wright, he's strong. He, he, he says, some, says some stuff now. 
and, and people get offended. Now, do, do, I have a, do I ever have a problem out of anything he's, he, he says? Of course, I wouldn't be human. Do I agree with every single thing? Of course not. I wouldn't be human. But I can guarantee you I'm never, never offended at anything he has to say. Never offended. I never take ownership as to that he means me harm. Never. No matter how strong he is, no matter how something may sound, no matter how whatever, I, I never take offense towards it. Never. Now, and I had to work myself up to being that, that way. I had to work myself up to being that way. Now, to have always a conscience, conscience void of offense. And so, again, back to my, my point, if some of you who, who recently told me you're offended, and a lot of you who hadn't told me you're offended, but, you know, something happens, you say, well, this and this happened, that and that happened, you tell me that this happened with this particular person, this particular person said that, or things happen and then your actions indicate and display that you're, you are offended. And so the question I, I have is, why do you think because you are offended that the person that did something or you thought did something is the guilty party? Do you understand that when you harbor an offense, you are the guilty party at that time. Do you understand that? The deception is, I've been wronged, or at least I think I've been wronged, and because I've been wronged, or because I think I've been wronged, then that person is guilty. The problem is, what if they are guilty? And if you have an offense, guess what? Now you got two guilty parties. Because now you have the Stockholm Syndrome. And so that's why you can't allow anyone to have power over you. Now, God doesn't assume power over you. You yield yourself to him. But the, the thing is, is people will get offended toward, towards God. Now, I, it's amazing how Paul addressed this. And Paul said, I, the first thing I do is make sure I'm void of offense towards God. Right? First thing I do is make sure I'm void of offense towards God. That's ever so important. important. I believe the first offense that ever happened was towards God. I, I believe I can show you that in Scripture, and maybe I'll get to it in another part of this teaching. Now, if we are, and I say we, I'm including myself, if we are justified by being offended, and we'll get into exactly uh, that definition of offended or offense, if we are justified in our offense because someone did something and someone did wrong, why is it that if someone did something to me, they are definitely in the wrong? If I'm offended, that person is wrong. You know what that means? That means that God is wrong. Because Paul said, I have to be void of a conscience of offense towards God first. And so if, if, if any time I'm offended, I'm definitely in the right, that means God has done something wrong. Get offended towards the word or because of the word. And there's scripture that says people get offended at the word and get offenses come because of the word. And so if I can get offended towards God, I can get offended at the word or because of the word. If I can get offended towards all those things that are right, then that lets me know by default there's no way in the world every time that I'm offended that I'm in the right and someone is in the wrong. Because I can be offended towards God, and God is never wrong. You may think he 
never wrong. You may accuse them because the adversary is working. Anytime we accuse God, trust me, it's not us that's working, it's the adversary. Anytime we bring any accusation towards God, God is being unjust, God is being unfair, God is being unkind, God is doing something to somebody else's life, and look what he's doing. Every single time that comes, mark it down, we fall into the, into the trap of the enemy because he's the accuser, and now he's accusing God for you, and you bought the, the lie, God, the same lie he told Eve in the garden, God is holding out on you, had God really said, and we fall into that trap. We fall into that trap. And so it's very important to understand this trap called offense. We need to know how to live free from the trap of offense. The, thing, the problem is some people think that it is an impossibility to live a life free from being offended. Can I tell you that that is the biggest lie from the enemy? Can I tell you that you can live a life free from being offended? You say, well, that's impossible. I got to live some spiritually. No, you do. See, the devil wants to make you think so many things are so hard in God. That's a lie from the pits of hell. We can live a life free from being offended. Does that, does that mean I won't ever get upset and mad? I'm not saying that. But you don't have to be offended. You may not like everything that happens. You may not like everything that someone does, but you don't have to deal with or be offended. You can overcome offense. Someone can do something to me, and I know I hadn't gotten, to, gotten into my, my, uh, my lesson yet, but if you, if you hadn't sensed I've been teaching without getting into this, and I'm sure I, I'm getting into some things that's on here, uh, Prayerfully, you get the point. Hopefully, at this time, you understand the critical nature behind this. Hopefully, even though I hadn't scratched, as the bishop said, scratched the surface of what I'm going to communicate, hopefully you really understand the significance and, and see the subtle nature uh, and the deceptiveness of being offended. And we're going to talk about some things with with offenses, being offended, how to overcome it, how to recognize it, and things of that nature, and to, to, to overcome, live an overcoming life, and just, just some things, some nuances and, and things of that nature, get into some definitions concerning and scriptures concerning offense. But I wanted to build this, this initial foundation uh, before I go on from here to, to build this foundation so, uh, so you can, can grasp uh, what's, what's transpired with this. So, again, Paul uh, addressed uh, this offense towards God and towards man, men. And um, I asked God, it may, be, it may have been today, this morning, God, I, when was the first offense, when did the first offense take place. Uh, I, I, and of course when I do that, I want to see scripture. And uh, we know the adversary, the devil, that he uh, iniquity was found in him, and that's lawlessness. That's not necessarily offense. And it never says anywhere, anywhere in the Bible that the enemy uh, suffers from offense, or any spirit bearing for that matter. I believe this is an act of man. And so when you look in the Bible and uh, you, you look at the, go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And you see uh, the sin of man. Obviously, Adam and Eve in the garden, they fell. They fell into sin. They weren't offended towards God. The adversary just told them that God is keeping something from them. So uh, at least told Eve that. And so Eve was deceived. She wasn't offended. She was deceived. The adversary told her that God is keeping something from her. 
and you're able to obtain this and get this. And he deceived her into participating in iniquity. She wasn't offended towards God. She was deceived by the enemy uh, of not seeing God for who he was. And thereby she uh, she, uh, was uh, tripped up to falling into this trap of uh, iniquity. And the Bible says her husband, who was with her, he ate and he he did it, uh, you know, and he sinned. She was deceived and he willfully disobeyed God. So he it was the first act of disobedience by man. He wasn't offended with God. He wasn't mad at God. He just chose. It was a free will nature. He chose to listen to his wife. She chose to listen to the adversary, believe what he said because she wasn't grounded in the word of God. He chose to believe and do what she said uh, simply by his free will. And then so you see the progression goes from iniquity, uh, deception, iniquity, um, and and, uh, willful sin. But then you see Adam and Eve's two sons that, is, that are mentioned, Cain and Abel. They bring the fruit of their labors. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Uh, Abel, he tended sheep. He brought up the flocks that God produced. And he brought that. And we know all the typologies. So I'm not going to take the time to get into that. But God looked down on them. And the Bible says God had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but God didn't have respect unto Cain and his offering. And what happened? Cain's countenance fell. Cain got offended. Now, before Cain killed his brother and before murder took, the first murder that was recorded took place, there was an offense in Cain's heart towards God. And so when Paul said he, he, he exercised, he always has a conscious, he exercised himself to, all, to have a, always a conscious void of offense towards God first, then towards man. That is ever so important. The reason why that is is because Cain was offended towards God accepting and approving of Abel and it, re, it was a bad reflection on Cain. And so Cain compared himself with the uh, acceptance of God upon Abel and the reject of God upon himself. And so he's dealing with shame. He's dealing with rejection. And he's dealing with anger. He's offended with God. And now he's offended towards his brother. And so he kills his brother. He's tripped up because of his brother. Because everything he saw, when he saw his brother, all he can do was get angry. They are out there in the field, and all he can do is get angry. Why? Because ultimately he was angry towards God. He didn't deal with that anger, and he didn't deal with that offense, and he carried that over towards his relationship towards his brother, and every time he saw his brother, it was a a reflection of who he was not. And so it wasn't that he was just looking at his brother and upset that his brother was being received. He felt bad towards himself. He felt rejected. He felt like uh, God was belittling him, that God wasn't approving him, that anything that he was doing wasn't good enough. Everything that he did fell short. And so he was angry and bitter because of how he felt towards himself. And he was offended towards God and towards his brother because of how he felt towards or about himself. I I talked to someone uh, recently and I was talking to them about offense. This is someone else. 
And I said, this is the problem with being offended. I said this. Is, I told another person, actually I told two people this recently. I said, you know your past. And I said, you assume that I know things about your past. And you assume this other person knows something about your past. And you assume what I'm communicating or what, and I'm telling you this now because you can assume that what I'm communicating is based on me knowing about your past, but I don't know your past. And I said, this other person that did something and said something, they don't really know your past also. But you think they know things about you, and when they're talking, it, uh, it's only giving you a picture of how you feel about yourself. I told someone else, you see, this person feels a certain way towards themselves, and because of this person's actions and what this person is doing and the things that this person said out of their mouth, they are, all that's doing is triggering how they feel about themselves. Can I tell you when you get offended, most of the time, a lot of times, you think that someone means this about this and that about that, and maybe they do in a certain way, but maybe their intent is different, and, but you feel a certain way about yourself. You won't tell somebody you feel this way about yourself. You won't let someone know you feel this way. Maybe you're even deceived that you feel this way about yourself. But the reason why we get offended is because of feelings inside about us. Now, when we get, get into the, the antidote of, of offense, when we finally get the antidote of offense, I guarantee you, if you can practice some of the antidote, take some of this medicine, you won't get offended as much. You'll say, well, you know what? I, I've been set free from this thing. Now, I pray. I, 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 what they say? Hit me up. I, <laughs> the street saying, I, 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 want you to, <laughs> wait, I want you to hit me up. I want you to let me know that when you're being delivered from offenses. I know we talked about this subject, the uh, church offense and all that, but we, we're dealing with it a little deep in the sense of making sure that we take care of this thing as individuals, not just because the church offended us and, and all that. I'm just talking about being offended, period. If everybody was here, I'd say, is this okay? Bottom line is it is okay. I, I'm trying to help us. I'm trying to help us. We need to do some work. We need a workout session, folks. And we don't need to just work out one time, get a gym membership, go to the gym one time, lead a membership, and forget all about it. No, we got to be. We we need a membership in the, the not in the gym called not being offended. And we need to go to that gym. Every, we need to get bulked up. We need to buff up. So we don't give in to this disease. So let's, let's talk about offense, the role. We're going to talk about the role of offense. And this is a, definitely a three-lesson, two-lesson uh, deal here. And uh, I think I've mentioned that to someone that it's probably going to be a couple-lesson deal. The word offense here, there are two primary definitions I'm going to deal with. Uh, as far as offense or the word offense here and then offended as well. But the role of offense, let's, let's talk about that. So the word offense here in Acts chapter 24 and 16 is the, the Greek word, it's, it's, it's proskopto, P-R-O-S, proskop, K-O-P-T-O, proskopto. And pros is like, uh, action towards. But cop is the main, this is the root word, K-O-P. And K-O-P is actually the root word that means to chop or to cut down. And so the root behind being offended is to chop or to cut down at least this particular word. We'll get into another one in a minute. And so it means of those who strike against a stone or other obstacle in their path. And so someone who strikes against a stone or another obstacle in their path is to stumble. So when you are offended, you are actually stumbling. It's not the person that offended you. 
Get that. You would think when someone did something wrong, that's the person that sinned. The Bible says when you are offended, you're the one who's stumbling. It's to strike one's foot against a stone. That's why the scripture says, talking about Jesus is the, the, uh, the stone that the builders rejected. The, 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 uh, the, he's the cornerstone. And he said many are offended. Many stumble at this stumbling stone. stumbling stone. He's a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, it's called. A stumbling stone and a rock of offense. I may actually quote that scripture, read that scripture out. But Jesus Christ said he was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. People get offended. Can someone, someone get offended at Jesus? Imagine that, right? Because we know Jesus is wrong. To strike one's foot against a stone, to meet with some harm. So here we go. See, that's where I've been wrong. I've been harmed. I'm not saying you aren't. I'm not saying I'm not. But if someone harmed me, you know, I got this. I got a, If you look, you, I have a marks on my head right here. I got a scar right here. I had my granddaughter asking, Papa, what's that on your, because I wear my glasses so much, I didn't have my glasses. What's that on your eye? I'm like, what, what? Well, I thought it was something there. And she was talking about this scar. I got this scar. Someone actually bowled me, and I had to get stitches. This, I was pushed down a flight of steps, and I had to get stitches right here. I had to get stitches on my nose, under here. I was all bust up. I, I was like Frankenstein. And they had to stitch me all up. But you know, and it hurt. I, they had to monitor me and watch me. I was a little child. But you know, the person that pushed me down the steps, they really didn't mean it. They were just trying to be an uh, imitator adult, and they pushed me, and they were trying to go down the steps themselves. It was a toddler, and they was going down the steps, and they thought they could push me in the stroller down the steps. I went down the steps in the house, rolled out the door, and went down the steps, <laughs> and ended up on the sidewalk, almost <laughs> losing my life as a little infant. But they didn't, I, I was hurt. But they didn't mean it. They didn't mean it. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were doing. So we can, ha, we can suffer harm, and someone can do us some harm. But maybe they didn't know what they were doing. Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It means to, to be induced to sin, to stumble at a thing, to be induced to sin. Do you know when you are and when I am offended, I'm induced to sin? I'm so susceptible to sin when I'm offended. Because when I'm offended, that opens up my spirit my heart and my mind, and that will cause me to sin, and that is to miss the mark. And you, you may be thinking of gross sin, you might be thinking of rob a bank and murder and all that, but whatever sin, when you and I are offended, we are in, to be induced to sin. And Paul said, you know what? I want to be void of, uh, I want to have a conscience always, always have a conscience void of offense, of being able to be induced to sin, to be chopped down or cut down, to strike at my path and to stumble and to fall. All those things. We uh, have the ability we have the means, we have the power, we have the privilege, we have the right, and we also have the responsibility to do as Paul said here. Paul didn't say this so he can just brag and he can have a trophy on the shelf, plaque on the wall, notch on his belt he, or notch on his gun for that matter. He was communicating a principle that he was expecting those that followed him as he followed Christ to live by. 
he was communicating, hey, he said in one place, follow me as I follow Christ. And he's saying in this place, hey, this is what I do. So by default, I am expecting you to live this way. You want to follow Christ as I'm following Christ. You need to exercise yourself also. Watching me exercise is not going to do you any good. Hopefully you seeing me exercise will motivate you to exercise, Paul, as the whole uh, backdrop of this is. And so I'm exercising, Paul is saying, to always, in my conscience, the problem with, with a conscience is some, some people's conscience is so much. Do you know that you can have your conscience seared? Where it's no longer operating? The Bible talks about people having their conscience seared with a rod of hot iron. Seared. When something is seared, if you burn, you can burn your body and have third degree, second degree, first degree burns over the body, and you won't feel, somebody can touch you, doctors say, can you feel this? And you'll say, I can't feel a thing. Your nerves, the, your, the sensory and the nerves and everything else is deadened to feelings because they've been seared and burnt to now you can't feel a thing. And so when your conscience is seared, you can't even tell whether you are offended. And the more you get burned, the more you feel burned, the more your conscience is being desensitized. We live in a world where people are being desensitized from everything. We live in a world where Christians are so desensitized in their conscience to when someone does something, says something, whether intentionally, unintentionally, whether to mean harm or not mean harm, or whether something was supposedly done or misconstrued construed or misunderstood or maybe they were vicious. Our conscience can get to such a place that we can not even see that we are carrying and harboring an offense not only towards man, but towards God. That's a dangerous place to be in. It is one of the several reasons why some Christians won't make it. Iniquity, we find, is one, the Bible says, in Matthew chapter 7, that many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in our name, done many wonderful works in your name, cast out devils? He said, I never knew you. We understand iniquity. It's one reason why Christians, some Christians won't make it. That was the first sin of Satan passed on down to Adam and Eve. And we find offense as another one. As Jesus said, your heavenly father can't forgive you if you don't forgive others their trespasses. Obviously, a child of God who's backslidden and decides never to return That is obviously another one. Uh, but there are very few things uh, that a child of God would go to hell because of to not be saved. 
That's why this subject is so important. We understand and know if God is not the Lord of our life, which is iniquity. If he's just Savior, but he's not Lord, he's really not Lord, we're not going to be saved. And if we have a, an offense, we're not going to be saved. We can deceive ourselves and think we're going to heaven. I'm telling you right I know for, for a fact. If, I'm, if I have an offense towards someone, if I hadn't forgiven someone, I know I'm not going to heaven. I know that. Because it's the Bible. And some people want to try to, I know some people don't believe this. I, you know, I talk to people and some people, they, they say things that's not in scripture. They say, well, I, I know you, you know, y'all don't believe this. I'm like, <laughs> do you read your Bible? If I, you know, I don't believe something. You know, I'm getting it from the Bible. <laughs> Show me your book for your beliefs. If a person's faith is it's based, it's based on uh, superstitions and what everybody else thinks and everybody else says and everything else, uh, and it's not founded on the word. I, I talked to somebody almost a year ago, and they were telling me some things, some spiritual things and I'm like do you, you know, I don't I don't believe I said, this is what the Bible is. and they 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 believe in God and all that and uh but people believe all kinds of strange stuff that's not in the Bible and when stuff is in the Bible they don't believe that they'll believe something that's not even in the Bible but they won't believe something that's in the Bible and there are people that believe you can go to heaven. doesn't really matter what you do, this, that, and the other. Doesn't it, None of that stuff matters. Only that matters is when your funeral, time for your funeral, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're going to heaven. Hopefully, huh, apostolic believers. You don't want to be an apostolic believer, but prayerfully, you don't believe that deception. Prayerfully, you believe in the truth. And Jesus said, do you, I got a question for you. And I'm, I, there are some people out there that are listening that have their own beliefs outside of the Bible. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? You say you believe in Jesus. In order to believe in Jesus Christ, you need to believe in his words. And, G, and I know some people say, I had somebody tell me, somebody, somebody actually go to a Christian. They said, well, I said, well, this is what this said. They said, well, that's not in red. <laughs> So I don't have to believe, I believe what's in red. Well, what I'm saying to you right now is in red. <laughs> Jesus said, if you don't forgive your, father, your brothers of their trespass, your heavenly father can't forgive you. Can you go to heaven without God for, forgiving you? Can you honestly go to heaven without God forgiving you? Can you? Can you go to heaven with, with, without being forgiven by God? If you can't go to heaven without being forgiven by God and if being offended with a person, God can't forgive you, one plus one equals two or A plus B equals C, whatever. You want to do addition or uh, algebra, it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is this. God said, Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, Our Heavenly Father can't forgive you. But God can't forgive me and my stuff stays. That means I can't go to heaven if God doesn't forgive me. If you can go to heaven not being forgiven, please show me. But God can't forgive me strictly because I'm carrying an offense towards my brother and I don't make it. That's, to me, that's, that's quite simple. Period. I have a question for you. Is that worth it? And it doesn't matter who that person is. I think some people think it, it, the offense means I got to be offended with somebody, some mass murderer. You can be offended towards God, offended towards your mother, your, your brother. I'm talking about your natural brother, your sister, your children, your parents, your spouse, your neighbors, your co-workers. Your boss, your employee, your employers, it doesn't really matter. Again, God. What God has allowed and God has not allowed in your life. Is anything worth you not making it? 
is any offense worth you not making it? That's the question I pose. That's the question I leave with you. We will pick up uh, next time. It won't be on a Sunday morning. We're going to talk about the reasons, the reason for offenses and why they happen. I got scripture on that. And we're going to get into some more things about motives, God perspective. I got some good stuff here, folks. This is just just the beginning. So we're going to end this right here. I pray that at least um, I've stirred you, if nothing else. Hopefully I didn't offend you. <laughs> if I offended you, it's a good start to make sure you, you see that, hey, something's going on here. I'm closing with this thought. When I am dealing with offense, God is trying to help me see that there's something that he's trying to do in me. It's nothing but an indication. When you start coughing, that's an indication there's something there. When you start sneezing, you start blowing your nose, when your eyes start to water, when you experience pain in, in your abdomen or, or somewhere else, that's just an indicator that something is going on. Do you understand when you get offended, that's just an indicator that God's trying to deal with you? Not somebody else. <laughs> when I get offended, God's trying to deal with me. He's not trying to deal with someone else. God bless you. When we pray right now, Father, this uh, message and this word is not to condemn anyone. It's definitely not to condone our actions, but it's not to condemn any person. It's so we can be healed, so we can be whole, so we can be healthy, so we can be consecrated unto you, so we can be holy, so we can be saved. We want to be overcomers, oh God, of offenses. And God, I bind the deception of it. I bind the lie of it. Set us free from this trap. Set us free, God, from what they term the bait of Satan. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. We'll pick up probably Sunday night on overcoming offenses. God bless you real, real good. In Jesus' name.